We own those property rights. <laughs> Uh, well, everybody, welcome back to the Genus Brewing live stream. This is a live stream that we do every single Sunday at 8.45 Pacific Standard Time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's a super fun thing. We, uh, we go over some beer topics. Um, today we're talking about some strange beer ingredients that you probably never thought of to put in beer and how they work. <laughs> we go over um, a beer style of the week. Um, that is a BJCP breakdown slash how to brew slash uh, best ingredients list of everything you could ever imagine in mm. beer. Uh, and then we go into some Q&A. So we uh, take your questions and answer them as thoroughly as possible um, at the end of the show. And that's kind of a live thing where you get to ask us some questions and we tell you some answers that may or may not be right. So welcome. Today we are joined by a guest you have seen before. His name is Thomas Crossgree. He is opening up Emerus Fermentation Projects. And I kind of use him as the, uh, the go-to <coughs> ancient beer uh, nerd in Spokane that <laughs> I know of, as well as uh, the purveyor of... Uh, putting honey, herbs, and wild foliage into beer. Yeah. Uh, so you want to talk a little bit about yourself, a little bit about Emerus? Sure. Yeah, thanks for having me back. I love being here. Uh, super fun. But, yeah, we're on track. Should be opening late spring, early summer. You know, that's always uh, difficult to uh, be exact on those forecasts. Very first mention to anybody public, though, uh, we'll be doing a little pop-up uh, on February 21st over at uh cochinito so yeah that sounds really interesting yeah that'll be fun we'll have food and beer like, and mead and people might even want to come out now so uh yeah we'll see how things look by by then <laughs> uh, we're we're designing the whole thing to be 100 percent takeaway and if we can do inside then we'll pivot a little bit yeah. but for those of you not around um washington state yeah i just realized that that's probably why it was still on um sorry we're, we're uh turning off some noise for you yeah, for those of you not around Washington State. There it is. Oh, God, that's so much better. Uh, Let us know, guys. We found it sounds super duper crispy. Um, we, uh, we now had regulation changes that allow what's called open air seating, which means as long as we open up a garage door, um, people can be seated indoors again. So that's pretty cool. Um, thanks, Peter. I thought, I thought you were on it. Anyway. Continue on, please. Uh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> follow on the Facebook page right now. That's just our kind of main outlet at the moment. Um, but we'll have more official announcements on that. But you can save the date, February 21st. And we'll be doing that out of the Cochinito uh, Taqueria, downtown Spokane. Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, also, everyone that is tuning in, uh, if we get 169 Six. likes today, Thomas will swing around on the rope above his head. Uh, that might have come out really bad, too. In, a, in an interpretive <laughs> dance. Yes, probably did. <laughs> All right, we'll go back to the spoken word poem. Uh, well, let's just jump right into our Genus Brewing News. There's not a lot this week. Um, uh, obviously, we got uh, Emerus doing their pop-up at Cochinito. Uh, around the Genus Brewing world, we have a Will It Beer tasting so. Uh, which will be it done today, which means that we should have that video out by the end of this next week. Uh, we also did a blonde uh, experiment with uh, one blonde ale done with Kaiser, Sundew, and Bonanza. Uh, so Kaiser being the German ale strain from Imperial, Sundew and Bonanza being the, uh, the CRISPR Cas9 modified uh, yeasts from Omega yeast. And so they're supposed to really push forward some esters and leave behind some four vinyl glycol uh, phenols. So we'll see how those taste. <coughs> I believe I'm going to be doing some blind tasting with some people when they come in today. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's nice. that story. Sounds good. Um, other news around genus, um, other than, I guess, yeah, we got, uh, we're able to have people inside with a garage door, um, beer that we got. We actually didn't brew any beer this week, did we? Mm -hmm. uh, nope. Not a single batch. This is, uh, that's unprecedented. There's any new one. We put our, uh, uh we, we put our 14% Imperial barley wine on. Yes. And, uh, Cascadian dark ale. That's true, yeah. Um, Our, uh, Cascadian Dark Ale like from, um, from the Black IPA video that we did <laughs> three weeks ago. Uh, Something like that. That's on tap now and tasting fantastic. So Yeah, and that kit is also on our website. So if uh, you are a fan of Cascadian Dark Ales um, but have a hard time sort of building up your own recipe for the style or uh, just trust our expertise, we do have that kit available um, as should be all grain and extract on genusbrewing.com. Corn so. country. Somebody's from Iowa. Woo. So with that said, um, I think it's time for our beer of the week. Bump, 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 beer of the week. Oh, yeah. 
got you got you got half season there. You got. You I got did. Little, I wasn't quite ready. We'll, we'll call I'm that sorry. Guy. No, I was <laughs> we tried to, to do a warm up <sighs> for you. Uh, the beer of the week this week is Sati. Sati is an, uh, one of the ancient style ales. Uh, my first <clears> experience with Sati was the Dogfish Head Sati that he come came up with back when Sam Calagione was doing all the uh, you know the random different ancient you know, pop up things. Um, and a lot of them, I believe, are now staples or mm-hmm. still staples. Uh, I think Dome was my favorite. I don't know if you remember Dome. It was like a, uh, the Egyptian uh, – um, maybe we just used Dome fruit. I don't know. It was some Egyptian beer that was not mm. – yeah, it was – I don't remember that one. It was – it came in a ceramic bottle, which is why I liked it. Anyways, all <laughs> that aside, we are doing sati today, which uh, – Thomas, you want to give a rundown on what a sati is? Sure. Um, so a uh, juniper-centric uh, beer – um, it uses uh, Juniperus communis. I might be messing that up, but it's a field juniper. It's not the kind that grows around here in our specific area. Um, so you either need to plant it yourself. It will grow here. It just doesn't wildly. Um, it does grow around most of the world, but that's uh, very, very concisely. It's yeah. a juniper ale. Yeah. So uh, it, it grows like south and north of here. Mm-hmm. Of, yeah, it grows across the entire world, just like we're in this weird little pocket where it doesn't grow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And so we're going to be kind of, kind of doing a breakdown of how you might uh, see a sati done a little bit more traditionally, like the ancient styles, and then obviously how most homebrewers will probably try to emulate it at home. Won't be sati, but it'll get you close. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, to uh, give you all the exact um, style, this is technically falls in a historical beer, which is t- style 27 a so yeah you know because random stuff in, in there some people all, like all the official that. yeah <laughs> the encyclopedic stuff and go and look it up yeah that's awesome yeah if you gotta if you gotta categorize it and everything like that and sati can be uh uh can vary pretty wildly but it actually can be semi-alcoholic i think the mm-hmm. uh, by the bjcp historically it's uh, between seven and eleven percent so getting up there um which is strange because how it's done uh, it's typically a no boil style of beer mm-hmm. Which makes it hard to get sh- concentrated sugars in there. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, a lot of times just an open air, wild inoculation. So, you know, just kind of depending on what's in there. And that can be a little bit difficult to get started unless you really know what you're doing. Yeah, unless you got the right random bugs again there and then mm-hmm. can actually go up that high. Because a lot of wild uh, yeasts, a lot of people don't know this, uh, wild beers are typically lower alcohol because wild yeasts typically couldn't handle them. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's go into our malt of the week. We're going to go over the traditional uh, way to make a sati and the kind of the cheater's way to make a sati. Uh, if you're going the cheater's way, our malt of the week is going to be flaked rye because it's uh, the most pungent, easily accessible, undermodified uh, rye available. So flaked rye is going to give you that classic kind of pumpernickel spice mm-hmm. and a little bit of earthiness to go with it. Yeah, yeah, it's a really nice one I like to add in um, for some body, uh, some residual um, not necessarily sweetness, but yeah, that body Mouth to feel, it. Mouthfeel, yeah. Mouthfeel, thank you. It's and the so early. Earthiness that goes along with it. <laughs> yeah. If you're kind of trying to build up a recipe, I'd probably say somewhere in the, you know, so, some sort of an under-modified Pilsner, something with a higher protein content would be your base. You're probably looking anywhere between, with flaked rye, you could probably go 10 to 15%, but in, uh, traditionally, uh, oh, you can also use something like a Munich malt to build out a middle. It doesn't have to be a super light beer, uh, but uh, if you're going super traditionally, you're actually going to get a lot of your color from uh, dark rye, mm-hmm. um, or a really pungent dark rye called, I'm probably going to butcher this, Caljamalas? Cal I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that one either. So. <laughs> yeah, we're call, calling it Caljamalas, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a very specific dark rye. I think when you see marbled rye, you got the light and the dark stuff. Uh, the stuff that's really, really pungent that half of kids hate on the Rubens and half the kids fall in love with it because mm-hmm. they're, uh, they're probably psychopaths. Could it be, um, <laughs> yeah. Could it be called But that, uh, that pungent dark rye can Jamalias. be difficult to get, but it's going to give you that more typical sati flavor. Uh, and honestly, the pungence of the, of the beer in general is a big part of why juniper is such a... Uh, a welcome flavor in the, mm-hmm. in the final product yeah yeah and a lot of times um i don't know if you're wanting to talk about some of that we've got it on the notes but uh traditionally you'd take uh full bows or branches of the juniper in the mash um another way you can sort of cheat that is just by using uh juniper berries yeah um so that will still impart a very similar flavor the the, the foliage and branches are going to be a little different than the just the isolated berries but that is a way that you can do that yeah so that's a little bit of a cheater mechanism and we actually when we did our uh, our collab probably three years ago now um with uh, a bunch of different breweries in spokane i think you did something similar where you just threw a bunch of the branches from uh, a Christmas tree yeah. in, the yeah. bottom, in the bottom of the mash tun too. So. Yeah, when I'm using, um, uh, partly because uh, the correct type of juniper doesn't grow around here, and some types of juniper can carry some toxicity. So just as a warning there. Yeah, they're um, really high in uh, terpenes, right? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. There's some terpenes, um, and I'm I'm blanking on that other constituent, the, the the chemical that's in there. Um, at any rate, uh, just check out what um, varietal of uh, species of juniper you're messing with. But I'll I'll use that same method uh, if I'm using pine, spruce, or fir, which of course do grow around here in the Northwest. Uh, just everywhere. Generally a little safer. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you can, you can uh, consume any of those species of those three. So those are always going to be just fine. And uh, I'll clip off bows of those and just put them right in the mash and, and kind of emulate that sati style. Yeah. So uh, to you, uh, traditionally you can use hops, but it's not necessarily uh, needed. Um, and, and hops in this, since it is a no boil beer, were all, were all, would always be done in a like a separate steep, a side mm -hmm. steep that would go in, uh, you know, during either the lotter or just right into the, into the boil. Um, but hops, I don't think are super necessary. Do you usually use hops in this style? Uh, it's been back and forth. I couldn't tell you um, like a percentage, but sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah. And if you do, I would just say just pretty much any noble or earthy hop and you're mm -hmm. using it to a small amount. Yeah. Um, uh, so let's talk about yeast. Uh, you said you mentioned that tr tr traditionally this uh, beer is open air fermentation. I've seen a lot of people also using like uh, bread cultures that they mm -hmm. have in their house. Yeah. Um, and uh, the best I can come up with for a kind of blend, if you're doing the cheater method, is actually going to be a blend of the Bavarian wheat blend, uh, which is kind of a, a semi, it's a more clovey and less banana y, but still with some banana uh, blend of yeast from wine yeast. Uh, and then actually Irish ale. Irish mm -hmm. ale, I think, for, uh, if you ferment warm, provides a certain funk that can give you the reminiscence of having that wild inoculation. Mm -hmm. um, also adds a little bit of acidity. Uh, and then it, uh, it it's readily available. But if you, I mean, would you say, uh, if you were to use uh, wild bread culture or something like that, would you say a sourdough is a good way to go or just a standard bread yeast? Uh, again, it de depends just a little bit. A lot of times with that open air fermentation, you're going to get pulling some bacteria and stuff. So then uh, doing like a sourdough type of bread yeast or, or even just using some sourdough starter, I've seen some people do. I've never done it that way, but I've seen people do it and I've drank their beers and they're always great. Um, I said always, maybe not always, <laughs> but yeah, there's, I, I think can, there's going to be quite a range in the fun. Yeah, the there will, sure. there will be a lot of range on that. Yeah. Um, but if you're after something a little more clean, um, uh, but with some of that extra character, that rustic type of character, then you can use some uh, uh, kind of cleaner bread yeast. Uh, yeah. And Logan, I did actually uh, mention, uh, we tried, we tried uh, Teddy's uh, beer from uh, the grain shed and they did mm, the yeah. beer of sourdough. Yeah. If you, if anybody who's seen our fermentous yeast video, he's in the end of that talking about a lot of the beers that they've done. Uh, and that one was actually, I would say really, uh, um, it was wild, but it fit really well because they have a lot of high protein malts mm -hmm. and it was very sati esque It reminded both of us very much of a sati. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to call myself out to, uh, I said, I said, Sweden, it's Finland. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm sure. So I'm sure these versions exist amongst all the Northern European countries. Yeah, they do have different um, ones and I couldn't even, uh, recite them off right now, but that entire region, uh, in the far North of Europe, yeah. um, d has used historically a lot of juniper and they have their different specific style names, for whatever reason, sati became kind of the most, uh, I don't know, the catch -all. globally recognized, uh, maybe. Yeah. But um, <laughs> Blame it on Dogfish Head. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And I would say, too, you know, you guys are talking about, you know, trying to get sourdough cultures and stuff. And I think that's a great start. But uh, now that we pretty much have all these uh, um, access to all these uh, quike strains, mm -hmm. I would say maybe to co-pitch just to make sure that you that you do manage to, to finish out that fermentation mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you're talking when you're talking about a sourdough starter, you might not have the most alcohol resistant yeast. Right. In there. Yeah. Um, so to push that, you know, double digit mark potentially, mm -hmm. uh, depending on your wort, uh, it, it's probably a good idea to have something that, you know, is going to, is going to actually attenuate. Yeah. And, and, and that's, out. that's a good point too. Um, a blend that I've really liked, like what um, Peter was talking about, but a blend that I really like on some of these, uh, whether it's sati or some other um, similar style, style beer, is getting a quike and then putting that in with either a Bavarian or even Saison uh, yeast. I like yeah. co-pitching those. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeast blending is a great way to get exact flavors. Mm -hmm. uh, Irish is one of my sneaky beavers when it comes to uh, things you can blend with that actually taste really good because it's nice. not something you'd ever expect because Irish is kind of a naturally funky yeast. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's one of my favorite things to blend in. It actually goes great in hazies and you wouldn't expect it to. Oh, wow. I have, yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you guys are thinking of yeast blending, that's uh, that's my one sneaky one. Nice. Uh, let's go into I, I added this one because I think it's important for this specific style. Uh, but I added a technique of the week, which mm -hmm. I'm going to call mash ramping. 
Mash ramping. Mash ramping. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, uh, with a lot of traditional old world style beers, they didn't have temperature control. They didn't mm -hmm. have, to, uh, you know, they didn't know a temperature. So the best way to maximize extraction was actually to start with a relatively low temperature. Traditionally, they'd even start this at room temperature, mm -hmm. basically, and then they would just slowly heat up the entire mash uh, over the course of you know six eight hours, uh, and then they'd probably top it off right around 180 degrees if they really knew what they were doing maybe even just get it to a boil kind of depends um and then they would just use that runoff or ferment right on the grains to get their flavors mm -hmm. uh, but uh in the homebrew world i think you're probably good for most cases just to start off you know somewhere in the you know 120 to 130 range and then kind of ramp up to that 180 range but uh, take a good couple hours to do this so you're getting full conversion over the entire mm -hmm. temperature range and i've even seen some uh farmhouse techniques uh, very rustic uh you know generation after generation and they're still doing it this way um they'll actually you know start it off at a cold temperature bring that up and then they actually just boil the entire mash they, they're not taking runnings they're not separating yeah. the wort or anything they boil the entire thing um, they're getting a little more tannin extract out of the the grain husk they're, you know so there are some specific reasons for that um, but that is actually another technique that you can maybe look up a little bit more or something. Yeah, yeah and I know a lot of people try to think, they think that it's going to give off flavors because they hear that you're going to get uh, a little bit too much uh, astringency mm -hmm. from grain in your mash or grain, grain at a hot temperature or whatever. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the tannin in beer compared to the tannin in wine, it's highly disproportionate. So yeah. mm -hmm. honestly, tannin can sometimes even add body to a relatively dry beer if it is yeah. like a while. And if you're not hopping it, yeah. um, that does help um, kind of, you know, tannins do provide uh, some body. They provide a little bit of um, a little bit of preservation, um, even even some mild bitterness. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. And going off that, too, you know, we talked about uh, decoction mashing last week. Um, that's basically one giant decoction yeah. at that point, right? <laughs> Just um, one and, slow ramp. Yeah, and from what I've seen, you know, I, I think there was actually, a, what was it, Chop and Brew, another YouTube channel, put out a video like a year ago or something um, where they actually went and some, like, some old guy showed him like the traditional way that he made it. And I want to say he did uh, boil the whole mash, and he had this giant – giant kettle over a, an open fire oh yeah and uh and yeah boiled the, the whole right there <laughs> yeah and, so and, amazing <laughs> and boiled the whole mash um and so you know we talk about like the what the wide color range what is it four to 22 srm mm -hmm. so like crazy color range um in there and so yeah a lot of that could just be you know how how much maillard reactions you're getting you know mm -hmm. how how you're darkening it if you if you are end up boiling that whole mash. And I think that's an interesting point that, um, you know, there's a wide spectrum on even just the color. But in a lot of yeah. these historical uh, uh, styles, um, you know, the temperature, they didn't know the exact temperature. They couldn't say, oh, we need to hit 150 for an hour. Yeah. Um, but there's going to be a lot of forgiveness on uh, some of the results of these th these types of rustic historical beers. And it's part of what gives them character. I, you know, I like a lot of that. Uh, I do too. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it makes it certainly different, and it uh, honestly kind of takes my brain away from the the things that we're trying to do every mm -hmm. day, which is you know, like let's nail that perfect amber. Let's show you how to make the hazy IPA that everyone wants to make. Like, yeah. Uh, doing these old world styles where you're kind of broadening people's perspective of uh, what beer is supposed to taste like, I think is uh, it, it, it opens up the door for a lot more people to you know say hey this is also a good flavor and this is what i'm going for mm -hmm. yeah go terroir is a thing that uh, yeah i know yes uh i mean like terroir a lot of people familiar with that um you know the flavor of the land if you will but there's also the flavor of the maker the flavor of your equipment the flavor of just the air especially if you're doing an open air inoculation so mm -hmm. so much of that character gets to come through and i, I love those aspects yeah uh, I think that's a pretty good lead in into our topic today, which our yeah. topic is uh, using strange ingredients that you've never thought you can use and mm -hmm. how you actually use them. Um, let's let, I'll, I'll, I'll let you start this one off because the idea for this came when you brought me uh, those beers that you brought me last week, which I thought were really good beers, and I thought that was a you know strange way to um, uh, to add. You're trying to add kind of a little bit of body and texture to your beer, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, or mead they're one of them they're both meads yeah the two that i had brought um uh, i was talking about the way meads i was calling them just uh but i was using way no way no way in many a, ways is this a new way of doing things it's a new uh, way uh, 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 <laughs> the puns to stop. actually no points uh points for the first uh, best beer pun that comes up in the comments oh you gotta watch <laughs> uh yeah so i mean just a very quick backstory on uh mead oftentimes lacks acidity uh, it can get super dry, especially at lower IB, uh, ABVs, um, not have a ton of body in it. So uh, I, I was thinking of adding some lactose maybe to help address some of that. Also really wanting to do some sustainable ingredient sourcing, uh, keep it local and all that stuff. So I reached out to Pure Air. They're a dairy down in uh, Othello. 
I got some whey and uh, in two different batches of mead, uh, each five gallons, I used two gallons of whey. Uh, this specifically was yogurt whey. Um, I have not used it to like inoculate a sour yet, but that's on my list of things to do. Yeah, might have to weigh your options. <laughs> well, when you throw it in your sour beer, you can just you're not you're not just throwing it away. Right. <laughs> We're gonna keep going. Because so. <laughs> it's inoculate. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so you, obviously, especially with uh, yogurt whey, you are getting the, lo- the natural lactobacillus that's going mm-hmm. to sour your mash, yeah. um, which is a really good start to doing a kettle sour. But you get by using yogurt whey, you get that extra uh, that extra protein. There is some lactose, or not a, probably not a lot. Not a ton of lactose, but there is a little bit in there. Um, yes, also the protein, uh, and then the acidity that's that's naturally yeah, in there. So in there. I felt like it worked pretty well uh, in the in the whey. I'm also or in the meads. I'm also going to try some beers with it. Um, but I, yeah, I think there's one sort of danger, if you will, um, there's, there's some milk fat in it. Uh, so I was trying to do a lot of separation. I'm still working on that just a little bit. Maybe we can have a little follow up someday, but, yeah. um, I'm also talking with the dairy just to say, Hey, do you have some you ideas the, on this? The globule but, of fat coming out. Oh the, man. Yeah. Off the pint. I've got some pictures of it. Like when I was transferring out of a carboy and it's just streaky all the way down. Um, the top of it looks like just the most gnarly pellicle you've ever seen, but it's just floating milk fat. <laughs> I feel like I'd yeah. have to just to maybe challenge some of the more sciencey people in here. Uh, uh, do a, a Willet beer that has like a whole gallon of milk in there, mm-hmm. and then like not like I'll let them know that I have. I guess I, I don't know if I'll let them know, but I'll have access to like rennet and the acids and stuff like that, so they could do the separation themselves on mm-hmm. the fly yeah. and see if anyone's smart enough to actually know how to use it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I almost feel like you need to post a photo of that uh, that milk fat to milk the funk and be like, and be, be like, hey, I'm having issues with head retention. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can anybody help me out? I took milk oh, the funk man. too literally. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh. All right, so that's that's way. Another thing that's kind of similar to way is going to be kefir. Uh, mm-hmm. Kefir has a different subset of bacteria. It's got a uh, um, kind of a colony culture similar to. Um, well, similar to yogurt, but also similar to like a kombucha or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Uh, but also, I mean, there's two different kinds of kefir. There's water kefir and milk kefir. But uh, I would say it also would work pretty similar if you used milk kefir. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I have used milk kefir to uh, to inoculate sour beer, and I've really loved it. Yeah. So and you use that as your pitch, though, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't like a kettle sour. Right. No, um, I haven't done a whole lot of kettle sours. I just I just prefer it. Um, not but <laughs> um yeah so and i just i just pitched some of that uh let that sit for a couple of days kind of in that same theory as some kettle sours but then i'm just not boiling it afterwards yeah da, 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 so da. what about oat milk yeah because, have you heard of using uh, oat milk in beer i have not um <laughs> i know some other people are using that it's kind of an idea that i've had um my wife can't have dairy so trying to get her something that's that, you know sort of that milky addition in there but something that she can drink is definitely something i'll be looking at yeah i know this is a new thing that's popping up with the hazy ipas Mm -hmm. people i I think it's just people getting tired of stuck sparges yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) just throwing rice hulls by the way that's that's a really easy fix (laughs) yeah i mean honestly Um, it isn't too much different than uh, i mean just because how how oat milk is made it's not too much different than using uh, oak uh, like uh, actual oak malt yeah malt yeah Um, but uh oak malt interesting yeah oak malt (laughs) Uh, or even just using like flake dough so basically if you were to make your own oat milk basically you're just uh, you're taking water uh, and a couple other things and you're just soaking it over the mm-hmm. oats repeatedly until you get the the concentration and density you want yeah. but it is going to be really high in proteins and certain starches that are kind of an easy way to get haze into your beer mm-hmm. and have you know a, still a similar fluffiness to you know adding lactose without actually adding lactose mm-hmm. yeah yeah it could definitely be a cheater method um for all these watching Definitely comment if you've used oat milk f- mm-hmm. before. Hello Beer did that one, and I thought it tasted pretty good, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. They did do that. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, think they used, I, th- I think they spent, like, $300 just in oat milk, though. See, oh, and that's wow. sort of, like, the give and take. It's, yeah. It's, it's, like, like, it's like, yeah. On the commercial scale, I don't know if I'd do it, but, I, I mean, I get there, you know, they you know want to be the next big thing and want to do the next big thing. And, mm-hmm. yeah, sometimes, you, you know, sometimes you got to throw, you know, eight lobsters in a five-gallon batch of beer. You know, that might be a little <laughs> yeah. expensive, but... <laughs> But dang it, <laughs> I know. But if you want to know. Yeah, uh, and that's where maybe making your own oat milk is going to be the way to go. Yeah, Just, well, you know, yeah, get I your flaked know. oats, make some of that. It's a little sure. more process and time, yeah. but... To me, that's just that much more pride in that batch. So. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's your, it's your own technique, and we're mm-hmm. always about you know how things should be technique driven. I feel like a lot of people want to uh, want to make up recipes that sound super fancy and everything like that, but then they get to the actual beer and they want to speed run through the beer. Yeah. And they don't take care of all the stuff they need to take care of. Right. So. 
Um, all right, let's go on to the next one, which one of the, is one of the things that uh, I think you have a little bit more insight than both Logan and I, uh, and that's going to be oak concentrate. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, this actually really exciting uh, new company. Um, I, I've been kind of working with them, but I'm not officially a part of it, just to, to be clear on that. But uh, they're called Soluble Oak. Uh, they should be fully in operation here in the next several months. They do have a website up, so check out solubleoak.com. But... Um, the guy's name is Cal, and man, when he brought some samples of this to me for the first time, I, I'll be completely honest, and I was with him too, I was very skeptical, because there's a lot of um, concentrates, there's a lot of extracts, there's a lot of, you know, just different ways, and oh, here's this new oak product, but they all to me taste medicinal or syrupy, uh, not only in the front product, but even in the finished beer. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was a little skeptical, but I was like, sure, man, let, let's see what you got. And I was blown away. I was like, this actually tastes like real oak. Um, so the idea of it is this, it's, um, it's dosed just like a liquid or similarly to an extract or something. Um, and it can get you right there to that barrel aged, um, quality just by dosing it, like pretty much just right on the table. Um, I mean, the one thing that's obviously going to be a little different is you don't get the aged essence of that gas exchange, um, the slight oxidation that can be appropriate in an old ale. The sherry. Kind yeah. Of notes. Yeah. So you're going to maybe uh, lack some of that if you're doing it this way. But the nice thing about this is that if you have um, spent barrels that just aren't giving off much character anymore, this little dose of soluble oak is going to yeah. extend that uh, life of that barrel for quite a while several more uses um i'm really loving it i love uh working with cal so far on it um so i suggest everybody keep an eye on that um it'll be available for home brewers and commercial brewers yeah. so yeah and if you're a home brewer too you know you're talking about on the large scale for mm -hmm. spent barrels but if you're a home brewer it means that you don't have to invest you don't have you know, to have a couple hundred dollars into tiny yeah. barrels are crazy expensive yeah like i cannot believe there are people that spend hundreds of dollars on like a five gallon barrel yeah, yeah. and <laughs> then it's like you got to wax the whole thing because the yep. gas exchange is so Way much faster yeah. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> it, it, and, and i'm not hating on those small barrels or anything but yeah but yeah it's it, it's definitely a leap that i wouldn't take but yeah the, i was actually because we uh, when he came in to do a taste with us, I was yeah, super we did surprised that it, cause Oak has a natural mellowing effect. There's, you know, you get the natural vanillins and everything like mm -hmm. that in a lot of beers and every beer that we put it into. And I, we tried it in the grapefruit hard seltzer. Mm -hmm. We tried it in, uh, you know, our coffee Kolsch. We tried it in, uh, you know, standard Amber. Um, but a lot of the sharpness is almost instantaneously dropped out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another super nice thing about this product is that it is pure white Oak. You're not getting, um, uh, a loss from say if, it, if there was wine in it before or if yeah. you or if there was spirits in it sometimes you want that um wine or, or spirit character which is totally fair you can add um, some wine or spirit to your beer yeah <laughs> yeah just put a shot of whiskey in it <laughs> uh, <laughs> but fun. um just a straight up beer uh extraction typically the alcohol content isn't even high enough to pull out some of those yeah. uh, amazing oak flavors. So this is getting a pure, uh, uh, full spectrum white oak flavor. And it, I, I'll be a fanboy about it. I'll be totally honest. It's a really great product. And so, so does he have only one, um, like just basically untoasted oak available right now? Or is, it, or is he actually toasting them? Uh, yeah, there's going to be a full line of heavy toast, medium toast, light toast, no toast. Nice. Um, also talking about doing some uh, various other woods because I'm very into odd yeah. things. And so Thomas he's talking to me, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're talking about doing like uh, birch extract, not extract. I don't want to call it extract, um, birch, um, concentrate, concentrate. Right? Yes. <laughs> I know sometimes I stumble over that. So tincture? I'm, yes, you want to call it a tincture, um, maybe. but yeah, we're talking about doing all kinds of other stuff, even maybe, um, like the stems of lavender and rosemary. We're going to do some of that other yeah. woody material and just experiment a little bit with that. Experiment with woodies? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, check it out. Soluble cedar, oak. Maybe. A Watch them. We've got um, quite a bit of that around here. Mm -hmm. so that'd be a fun one. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, um, yeah, so that sounds like a game changer to me because, you know, especially, you know, you starting in on that uh, conversation about <laughs> – we see these products all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I know we've played around with probably over a dozen different hop extracts now um, and, and oils and whatnot, and, and all but maybe one or two of them were pretty much unusable mm -hmm. uh, from, from what we've had. And, and we play with them, and it's just they're either too aggressive or they just, like, like you kind of mentioned, they don't match the right kind of flavor profile that you're going for. Yeah. Or they end up coming through, like, 
super super medicinal just because mm-hmm. they don't quite have that balance yeah in yeah them. so um so yeah that sounds like a really cool thing so i'm excited uh to see that come out and mm-hmm. hopefully we see a lot of brewers um and distillers for that matter around yeah the area yeah i mean dry flies already doing it right? yeah dry flies upper, been upper uh, playing around with it uh towns and wine uh, up on green bluff has been playing with it yeah. so yeah Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that could be crazy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one more time. What's the name of the extract concentrate company? Soluble Oak. And they're at solubleoak.com. You can start uh, checking that out. Someone's asking if we had to lower you in with the crane. This is actually, it's attached to an electronic winch and it is so we can remove him quickly if need be. Also, I needed the help getting it. This is a tall stool. So he's, he's a literal hobbit, by the way. I don't know if you need, he's a literal hobbit. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, let's let's move on. Uh, let's see. We got to, the next we got is uh, uh, herbs, spices, and teas, things like that, and uh, a couple different ways to add them. And so when we're talking about this, just to kind of rattle off a couple. Obviously, we've got like actual tea. Like if you get whole leaf mm-hmm. teas, um, you've used frankincense, myrrh. Uh, we'll throw mustard seed into that into there. That's a mm-hmm. spice. No. Yeah. Mugwort, bog myrtle. I know you use those in uh, like mm-hmm. a lot of your gruits and stuff. Yeah. Um, so what's the, let's talk about the different ways that you add those and kind of what you expect out of the group, uh, out of that group, depending on how you add them. Yeah. Uh, so each one's going to sort of carry its own um, method, or at least my preferred anecdotal preference of of adding these. Uh, mentioning like frankincense, myrrh. I also use uh, pine resins. He's gotten me giant <laughs> pine boogers before. <laughs> They're amazing. Oh, uh, never seen somebody get off so much on a pine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, using those tree resins, um, I like to just add in uh, uh, to secondary or, you know, uh, once fermentation's finished, just get that in there, uh, let it sit. Uh, if there's a nice big solid chunk, you can even remove it later doesn't necessarily always dissolve in there. Um, mustard seeds, like, yeah, mugwort. I mean, but any of these kind of familiar, familiarize yourself just a little bit because if you add it during the mash, you're going to get a fairly um, uh, softer, you're going to get a much softer uh, profile in the finished yeah. beer. Uh, so that's a really nice way. If you add it during um, boil, you're going to extract a little bit more bitterness. Almost every herb and spice is going to have bitterness to some degree or if you boil it or astringency yeah. something to that effect um pulling out more tannins with the heat extraction things like that um if you put it in during um primary fermentation you can even do that and you'll get some other uh phenolic character out of certain herbs and spices uh, uh and then secondary yeah probably the most kind of brightest uh true character if you will is going to be that uh, cool or alcohol steep once fermentation's finished up. Uh, uh, so a lot of folks like to uh, dry hop with herbs and spices. Now, sometimes, especially with fruit spices like rose hips or flower um, spices like lavender. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's exactly where I'm going. So if you're adding it into secondary once everything's all done, be very mindful of carrying in microbes and other you know stuff. That's where I think a lot of brewers do like to add it into boil or even uh, just whirlpool while it's still hot enough to kill those things off. Or just get a tincture with it. Or yeah, oh yeah. That's something that I don't do a ton. It's simply out of preference. It's not because I think it's objectively bad or anything. Um, I don't do a ton of tinctures, but yes, it's absolutely a way to to get around the mic, the, 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 the microbial. microbial stuff. Yep. Flora. Mm-hmm. You hit 70%, ain't nothing living. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as a, as a general kind of rundown, so you were talking about how, uh, so boil, you get a little bit more like woody, tannic kind of quality mm-hmm. than most of these, right? Yeah. Um, and and you, did you mention Whirlpool? Do you use Whirlpool a lot? Yeah, yeah. I think mm-hmm. Whirlpool can be a really great thing, very similarly to hops. Um, you're going to get uh, almost like that juicy or tea type of flavor rather than um, super bitter Yeah. Or, or, or tannic and stuff. It's still a little bit cool enough. Everybody's got their own little different Whirlpool pitch temperatures yeah. i tend to go about the 190 degrees uh once it's down there then i'll start throwing in some of those that's still warm enough to pasteurize um you know you're gonna get that good extraction still yeah and those i mean it's it's a whole nother realm of flavor blending right because mm-hmm. you know while hops have and don't get me wrong a very wide variety of, of mm-hmm. flavors for being from from a single organism yeah um kind of mind-blowing if you think about it oh yeah but, i think uh, it's amazing but uh, when you got all these different herbs, like the, the flavors 
the range of flavors just gets exponential. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, I know you got me hooked a few years back on, uh, lemongrass and mm. lavender. Yeah. Uh, like the blend of those two those literally so making, good uh, I call it fruit loop. Yeah. <laughs> beer. What, whatever you throw it into ends up smelling like fruit loops. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think that's just a great example of, of you take two things that otherwise, you know, seem like they could be all right by their, themselves and then they just blend into something completely totally un unexpected awesome. and uh and really really flavorful yeah and that's why i say you know not from a flippant point of view but any of these herbs and spices because they're so different and um, unlike hops it's not the same species of plant yeah. uh, they do all carry their own impacts their own tannic qualities their own uh terpenes yeah. their own, you know all these things so they're each going to have their own um kind of best or maybe preferred addition technique yeah. for sure well let's uh well first of all before we move on to the next uh, the next thing we're going to talk about which i believe is going to the uh, mushrooms nice uh, yeah. let's uh describe what you you brought me here sure <laughs> this um i'm calling a uh botch and save lager uh, so i was uh using scott's bear barley and i just really messed up my my efficiency it was going to turn out at about a two percent beer and i just didn't want something that light so i added in some buckwheat honey really that like was beer. save number one <laughs> or mistake and save number one uh, so now i got it up to five and a half percent definitely favors the honey side of things in this one then uh the other thing is yeah it was supposed to be a lager and i'm blanking on which lager oh i think i used a harvest mm -hmm. from imperial um and the room that I had set up in my house during the summer stayed a nice 50 to 55 degrees. In the wintertime, it's the neighboring closet to my furnace. Oh. <laughs> so it got Ooh. way too warm. <laughs> Even though we, we don't set our, yeah. our, our thermostat to 75, it gets up to 75 in that little room. Yeah. So I check it the next day and it's just screaming. I mean, this <laughs> lager yeast, it's going out the blow off tube. I've just got a little bit of a mess. It's a very happy Crud. yeast. Crud, yeah, <laughs> uh, it was angry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm like, oh shoot, I, I probably just botched, well, yeah, I botched this up. Um, from there, I took it out into the garage to cool it down. And then I was doing the garage kitchen counter, garage kitchen counter, trying to keep it at about 50 to 55. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you were going to say you threw it out in the garage and then it froze. That no, yeah. no, I at least didn't do that. I was, I mean, staying at home all day long for the, you know, every single day. It, it made it nice. I could at least, uh, do that kind of back and forth. Um, so then I was doing my best to keep it down in the lower fifties. Uh, but I was still just getting horrible off flavors. I'm like, man, do I dump this? Do I keep trying to mess with it? But I did my little magic trick that, I mean, everybody knows, but uh, I threw in some Britannomyces in it. Yep. And that's been eating up a lot of the, the stress uh, nice. from, the, uh, from the lager yeast. Uh, I don't think it's quite perfect yet. I'm holding on to uh, a case of bottles so, for yeah, maybe about ju June or so, and then start opening them up again. But Brett cures everything, guys. Yeah. Rule the story. If you <laughs> yeah. had a bad beer, don't dump it. Just add Brett. Yep. <laughs> Brett and save it for a little bit. Yeah. But no, um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with being able to save it and drink it now. So. Yeah, I'm starting to get some of those uh, th those mild hay, like kind of farmhouse flavors too. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's in a good spot. I definitely still get some like almost plasticky fennels, uh, but that, they're very, very light and they're probably going to go away pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know our experience that there's, there's been a couple of times where we've had not probably quite as extreme of a situation as yourself with that uh, harvest strain. Mm -hmm. um, but when it has for warm it definitely throws this like um i almost want to call it like prune wine flavor mm. um to it uh and and i can definitely see the brett sort of taking those and, and whatever whatever compounds those are that are creating those flavors yeah and, and turning them into something um a little more palatable um just because they can definitely i mean especially for a lager right? <laughs> they will overpower that you know, oh yeah real quickly so all right, well, let's go on to some mushrooms. And uh, uh, so you said you, you've used uh, chaga and morel mushrooms, right? Yeah, yeah, those are the two that I've used. Have you, used you haven't used chanterelles? I have it myself. I know others that have. Yeah, like a D Detar's used chanterelles. We had chanterelles in one of our Willet beer kind of mm -hmm. a mystery exper experiments. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get yours, do you get them fresh? Um, both of those I really like to uh, forage myself. Uh -huh. um, chagas aren't going to grow around here a ton, although they will some because they grow almost exclusively on birch trees, yeah. um, which I think gives them a very nice uh, flavor companion with birch. So the times that I've used, all except one time that I use chaga, I also throw in a little bit of uh, birch bark or birch leaf, something like that. Makes sense, yeah. um, 
Yeah, the the chaga mushroom is a really great one. Uh, it, it's got some of that classic umami, earthy type flavor, but being on the birch tree, uh, it pulls out some of that evergreen um, or wintergreen yeah, type minty. of super uh, pseudo mint kind of flavor. Yeah. Really, really interesting mushroom. Oh, cool. Uh, so I, I, I've used uh, fresh mushrooms before, too. Do you do anything to them to help extract the flavor more? That's one that so far I have uh, led to uh, doing at a, um, a very long term steep. Like uh, I did a barrel aged chaga birch beer once and I just okay. threw it into the into the barrel for I can't remember. I think it was about a year, actually. Wow. Um, it was so nice. <laughs> uh, uh, or what I've done is put it in Whirlpool and let it sit for about 30 to 45 minutes. Yeah. OK, yeah, I can see that. So that sounds like yeah, that's that's definitely probably the route I would I would take with mm -hmm. them is, is doing basically a giant tea with them. Yeah, I have done some teas or tazans, however you want to say that, but um, and I think boiling mushrooms is a really nice thing to do. I've done that with morels also. Um, uh, being up at Hierophant, we've, there's some uh, meads that that use uh, turkey tail mushrooms, uh, lion's mane. Mm. What was it lion's mane? Now I'm craving mm. mushrooms. Lion's uh, mane's like the chickeny one. Yeah, uh, and those are always added um, a, as a boil uh, tea, and then we add that gotcha, end up yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. So I've uh, the the only th other thing that I would that I would say that I've kind of also seen done but haven't done myself is dehydrating the mushrooms once mm -hmm. you get them um, the only reason being it kind of works the same way like when you get fruit and you freeze the fruit to explode the cell mm -hmm. walls yeah yeah dehydration opens up the uh, a lot of the uh, you know non otherwise non-porous components mm -hmm. so it basically increases the surface area that mm -hmm. you're getting exposure from um, and so what I've seen that done and then whirlpool additions because then you can get a, a shorter whirlpool addition because then you can get a quicker mushroom flavor mm -hmm. but sometimes that can get really intense you yeah. get a little bit of uh, sometimes lemony or like over lemony like uh, when lemon's too sharp like mm -hmm. you uh, have a pith in mm -hmm. them yeah. uh, kind of flavors but that's the only way that I've seen it done so I was kind of curious what you'd done yeah most of mine um, have been have been fresh additions especially if I'm foraging them myself uh, I have purchased chaga a few times and that always comes in dry mm. Have you noticed a difference when you use the dry versus the uh, the fresh? Uh, yeah, the, the the dry flavor actually works similarly to ginger, where the the flavor is actually a little more pungent. Yeah, a lot of people are thinking, oh, if you dry it out, you're going to lose a lot of yeah. That's which is but that's not the case with everything. Um, yeah. so and and yeah, that's not my experience with with mushrooms. It'll actually yeah. get more intense if you dry them first. Yeah. Um, all right. Do we want to go in? Let's talk about, uh, so the lot, let's, let's save trees for another episode. Cause I feel like that's going to be a long topic and I feel like we're going yeah. <laughs> to run out of uh, Q and a time if we do that, but let's talk about real quick, uh, weed. Logan and I actually did a, a podcast on adding weed to beer <laughs> almost a year ago right now. Really? Wow. <laughs> that yeah, was, that a, was a while ago. Yeah. Um, felt like two months ago, uh, but you have some experience with that too. Uh, so, uh, two, two kind of things to go over. One is kind of the actual, uh, mechanical extraction of the oils that you're looking for in weed. And then the other is how to add it for flavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Actually the very first time I made it was, uh, for somebody who was struggling, uh, just totally throwing it out there. Somebody was struggling with some cancer and just wanted some kind of pain relief while also having a little fun, I guess. Yeah. So uh, she asked me, she's like, is this something that's weird to ask? And I was like, no, I don't have a problem with it. And let's do this. It, it was kind of fun uh, first experience and um, certainly helped out a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, so uh, so for the uh, actual effects that you're going to get from that, so you have to do the whole decarboxylation mm -hmm. step. Um, do you do that? Do you usually do it in the oven or what, how do you do the yeah, decarboxylation? Yeah, I've experimented a couple of ways. Um, the way that I've had the most success is just a super low heat uh, in the oven. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what is it? I, I did not bring my notes. I apologize, but I think it was for, um, at like a little over a hundred degrees for about a half hour. Okay. I want to say double check that. I'm sorry. I shouldn't even, I shouldn't roll stuff off unless I'm confident about it. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, doing, doing that nice little heat, the decarboxylation, um, allows those components to be extracted later. And then did you just go right into the dry hop or did you go, I, cause we uh, talked about doing uh, um, just a, a tincture, basically, mm -hmm. with a decarboxylated uh, weed, because um, that's a better solvent, and obviously mm -hmm. it's THC, it's hard to be soluble. Yeah. It's an oil. So did do you do tincture? Did you go secondary? Did you do... I've, I, um, the few batches I've done with it, I've done um, multi-additions, so okay. like a little one just treating it kind of like hops. I mean, they're in the same... Family. Uh, yeah, same family there. Uh, Maybe the so, same genus, too. Are they the same genus? No. No. Um, I forget the genus on actual weed, but okay, well, same yeah. family. Uh, yeah, same family, Cannabaceae, or however uh, I always butcher those pronunciations. Cannabacapacada. Cannabacapacada. Uh, rosaceae. Yeah. Rosaceae, I think. 
Uh, not the family. The family yeah. is Cannabaceae. Maybe, maybe it's but, the order is Rosaceae. Uh, yeah. Probably a lot of things are in the <laughs> yeah in the rosids and roses. What yeah. kingdom is it in? Uh, <laughs> my kingdom. Uh, we Everything no light have touches. Kingdoms, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a super group. <laughs> Anyways. Um, no, but, but I've, I've thrown it into, for some flavor uh, and so forth, I've done a Whirlpool edition. Yeah. And, I mean, weed can be fairly expensive, so I don't do a ton of that in there. Yeah, My main part, yeah. um, effect and flavor, I've, I've just added in like a dry hop. Yeah. So in secondary... Um, Got a little bit of alcohol in there. Yeah, a little, a little alcohol extraction. Yeah. So on one hand, like when I was designing this first one and talking to my, that friend of mine, I was like, do you want a bunch of alcohol? We'll get a little bit better extraction that way, but I know you're not looking to get plastered. So yeah. I think we yeah. settled it was a five and a half percent. And then I just let it sit you in there a while. A couple, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we have a, we actually have a customer that uh, he, he, one of the, his, I think his job, maybe even the business that he owns is in weed extraction. Mm -hmm. And so when he started making weed beers, he was like able to like microdose the exact like THC quality yeah, that he wanted. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah. I haven't gotten quite that nitty gritty. <laughs> yeah. Neither have I. But it's fun. And I do think, uh, so one of the ways to get that flavor um, that kind of complements the, you know, the fact that it's a weed beer without necessarily wasting a ton of money on throwing weed in the, in the whirlpool, um, Black Label did this. So they use hemp seeds. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and that, uh, that's a really nice, you, you get a little bit other flavor out of that too, some nuttiness and things like that, which I really like. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All, all right, right. Well, let's, well. Uh, let's save the, all the trees because we have a lot more stuff that we could go over, cool. including yeah. uh, you know enzymatic uh, fruits and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We talked about a little bit when we talked about how to add fruit to beer a while ago in one of our videos. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that can go with tree beers, which Thomas is really good at, and I think we want to save him for another episode for that. Cool. Um, so let's go into some questions and answers. And then uh, maybe I'll have time to get to – we've had a, a lot of people asking us to open some more beer that they sent us. Oh, nice. Uh, and so I will at least try to get to one of those before it's the It's in the, the thumbnail. So did you want to talk about Tongsul? We should talk about – <laughs> It's should, in the thumbnail. We, we people are going to be like, what is that? We, oh, <laughs> so by the way, uh, baby poop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did put that in the <laughs> – let's, let's go over Tongsul. What is Tongsul? Uh, it is actually a – Korean poop wine, yeah. um, like literally, uh, it's, and it's you got a lot of shit for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's considered medicinal, but it is a fermented alcoholic rice beverage. Welcome um, to the tongues also. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you ever want to look into that, we were talking about, he's like, we're going to talk about maybe odd or unusual ingredients. I'm like, <laughs> do you know about tongue soul? <laughs> so, and I don't know the pronunciation. I'm probably messing that up. It's but. got two T's at the front. So yeah. T T O N G S U L. Tongue soul. I'm going I'm to be uh, honest about call, this. This is the first time I've heard about this. Uh, it is this an absolutely line. real thing. Uh, I, I mean, like, and are, it's are like pulling this out of your ass right now. Well, not mine. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> young children under the age of eight. That's yeah. like they consider primo poo is from young children it's just the weirdest thing um uh, <laughs> i've never tried it never made it i don't really plan to but is it is so a thing wrong? there's a no. lot of stuff that, okay so so first of all <laughs> poop isn't actually like a lot of people think oh poop is gross poop, poop, poop is gross don't eat poop but it's not actually gonna get you sick like a lot of people think they're, gonna, they're like oh you're gonna get e coli from it and then the truth of the matter is if you eat poop human poop from a healthy human that doesn't have you know mm. an infection or their E. coli isn't coming out their butt, which it shouldn't be, then you're probably not gonna get sick. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna taste like, well, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but I, they so they but they ferment the they ferment the poop first. Yeah, right? yeah. And then they add it to the, that that mixture is like an inoculant to the actual rice wine, or right? Yeah. Um, I think because I, I, just out of cu pure morbid curiosity, and this is over the like I first heard of it several years ago. Yeah, I'm trying. But, right um, now. Yeah. So I was like, how is this even real? How do they make it? There's some that uh, will actually, if you want to say co-ferment, uh, the rice and, and water and poop. Uh, and then there are others that make their poo solution and then dose it into the fermented rice beverage. So a couple ways of doing that, just like we were talking about with the herbs and spices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I feel like I want to know how it's considered any more medicinal than just the standard bacteria that you can ferment anything with. Right, and I, I, I did actually find it difficult to find that answer, so I don't know exactly what the medicinal quality is. I think it's just a historical drop down. That said, the final product doesn't probably taste as bad as you might think it does, because fermentation does cure a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So, would I try it? Absolutely. <laughs> if someone was I like, I have a commercial quality poop wine, <laughs> I would have to try it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, if somebody brought some and put it in front of me, 
I mean, right now I'm pretty confident. I'm like, no, no, nah, not interested. But, but if, if it was in front of me, you, I'd be like, I'd put it in the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to do it. All right, let's go into some questions. I got uh, one from Jimmy, which is actually probably a good one for Thomas. Uh, he is asking if you could use honey as a 5% hydromel and carbonate it as an alternative to hard seltzer. Yeah. Uh, in fact, with the new Emirates brand, I am looking at doing uh, some... Uh, sort of mead answers to the the seltzer yeah. world um so yeah it absolutely it's very bioavailable it's going to have a little bit richer uh body uh a sensation of sweetness even though yeah. all the sugar is going to ferment out um you know similarly to the table sugar or corn syrup you know yeah. whatever they're usually made out of um but yeah i i think that's a great idea absolutely would work yeah i i my take on it is as a home brewer i say yes everyone should be doing this mm -hmm. um it's a fantastic way to especially like kind of just the idea of like a session meat in mm -hmm. general um, yeah are fantastic i think the only reason why you don't see them popular on the market is uh, a couple things one honey is actually pretty expensive yes yeah it um, is so so generally the price point on those isn't going to be a five dollar pint mm -hmm. um uh, on a commercial scale and then also I don't think it is on the commercial scale either i think most people are buying kegs for like 160 170 bucks and yeah. so they're selling theirs for six dollar pints or 750 pints or whatever yeah so for. um and then the other thing too is thomas has his winery license here in washington state mm -hmm. um and that's a state specific thing but like we could not actually do a a honey uh mellow mel um or whatever you want to call it hydromel yeah. um, as a brewery here and so that's probably why, yeah. you, why you just don't why, why you're probably looking around and going wow that's weird why don't we see this on a commercial scale right. a lot? and it's just um, and really there's no reason other than some weird legal issues yeah and w mead um, isn't wine but it it is governed under yeah. the wine category <laughs> right. uh, so yeah to make a pure honey seltzer uh, a, a commercial outfit would have to have a wine license uh, certainly at home um, you can do whatever you want yeah <laughs> Yeah, and then I mean, I mean, not to like beat a dead horse. I'm sure yeah. we've covered this before, but yeah, it's it's like having that quick turnaround is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, that's a lot of people are afraid to get into um, meads and honey fermentations in general because they think they have to wait a year for it to mature or whatever. Right. But, uh, yeah. I mean, a big thing about that, just super quick, is um, proper yeast management. Some uh, really great O2 introduction at the onset of fermentation and a, a good nutrition for the yeast and you're going to have a pretty quick turnaround yeah i mean we're a little longer than beer but yeah like four weeks yeah something like that yeah, yeah. easy for like an easy four or five percent mead that can be done in a month yeah for sure so there you go there's your answer to that one we've got uh we had a bunch of strata hops that last week that we hadn't used if we were to use them what would you use them in uh, I mean, IPA is kind of the, the, the obvious go-to. If I were to use something and not an IPA, I would probably use them in, you know, something like if I were to do a, like a dry hopped American wheat beer, um, just a little bit of aromatics to a relatively clean wheat beer, get that same mouthfeel, get something on the general light side. So that'd be fun. Someone else is asking when the pickle beer is coming out, video is coming out, uh, hopefully before we actually polish off all the pickle beer we made. <laughs> we keep like trying the, to do it, but it's, we didn't we, actually put the video out. No. Oh. Well, we, that's keep, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of stuff from it. We just have to uh, get Hayden and I here and sober mm -hmm. and ready to do a video at the same time. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, none of those things will occur at the same time. Uh, Homebrew sixty one <laughs> said they brewed a orange Fanta milkshake. Uh, I'm guessing milkshake IPA because of the Willet beer, and it turned out real nice. And speaking of strange ingredients, Very nice. That we had a Willet beer that had, I don't know if you saw that one, but it's it used uh, a bunch of different various sodas. Oh, um, no, I missed that one. Yeah, so it's basically like Will Spody beer. Nice. Uh, and honestly, I mean, they've, they've got some artificially flavors, but at the same time, most of it's still sugar that's going to ferment. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Worked out. I'm seeing several questions about, like, are, are we after the, the terpenes, the flavors, the stuff out of the weed? For myself, I love terpenes and flavors uh, on a commercial scale so that it's legal and stuff. Right. Um, I'll use stuff sometimes to emulate that, like rosemary, uh, lemongrass, just those different types of terpenes. But I really like that. Also, terpenes have some really nice effects even by themselves, like myrcene that you find a lot in hops, mango, yep. and weed. Um, that has a really nice um, 
calming effect even by itself without any cannabinoids. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that uh, you know hops by themselves are a natural, they're a natural sedative, a natural mm -hmm. muscle relaxant. Mm -hmm. um, they've got a lot of medicinal effects that people didn't think like before they were used in beer. Um, they were also used. Uh, they, they were using medicine. They were used yeah. as like a you know you'd make little tea bags basically, and uh, they'd be like sleep aids. You put mm -hmm. them by your bed or something like that. Yeah, there were several ways tinctures. I mean, if you look up uh, Hildegard von Bingen, she was amazing at using hops medicinally, and some of it was just put it under your pillow if you're having trouble sleeping. Uh, she was also using it as a preservative in other medicines, but using hops as a preservative. Yeah, crazy, crazy stuff there. Um, so we got next question is from John. Uh, he is asking if as a new home brewer um, and experimenting, is it worth experimenting with smaller batches uh, or should he just go for the gusto in a five or 10 gallon batch? We kind of have a, a, maybe a different opinion than a lot of people do. And that is if you're going to experiment, experiment at least in the five gallon batch, unless it's like with uh, late additions, like a, um, like uh, dry hop additions or flavoring additions in the last bit, in which case you can split your five gallon batch into multiple one gallon batches. But in terms of fermenta fermenting or brewing an entire batch on the one gallon scale, we generally don't recommend it for the sake that consistency happens a lot mm -hmm. more uh, in bigger batches. So there's a lot more variables, um, even something as simple as the surface area of your fermentation vessel and how that can affect heat exchange mm -hmm. uh, with uh, smaller batches over bigger batches. So for consistency, I would say five gallon batches is a good way to go. Hopefully you have good brewing practices and you're not going to, you know, experiment with something really expensive and screw it up. Uh, but that said, if you hit, you know, if you hit gold with something, then you have five gallons of it instead of, you know, a yeah. couple nights worth of drinking. <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, and I think like a nice thing, uh, or at least something to be noted would be try to familiarize yourself with the ingredient before you just throw it in yeah um, and yeah that's what i was saying earlier <laughs> even with the herbs and spices and stuff exactly yeah so so you know this can be like we talked about earlier um if you got some some little herbs teas. and spices yeah mm -hmm. make yourself a little quick tea with a little bit of it it'll give you an idea of the aroma give you an idea of the flavor and uh and more so the pungency of it yeah and do gonna... when you're making those do an actual boil do 150 degree yeah. steep do a cold steep yeah you know if you really want to dial in kind of getting to know um, a given ingredient than than do a multiple yeah. uh, side by sides. Raw. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, even yeah. I mean that's I mean shoot even for malts. I literally taste every single malt raw before I put it into a beer. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of which, I don't know if you've tried uh, Link's new Dextrin malt. I um, haven't. But it's fantastic. Is it? Yes. Awesome. I was very it's, interested it's to see it. definitely got this subtle buckwheat honey thing. Oh, nice. Anyway. I do like uh, buckwheat we'll, honey. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a side note. We'll, we'll get back to it. Um, so, yeah. So, um, I mean, familiarize yourself with your ingredients. And then, yeah, generally we recommend... Not Thanks. doing super small batches, five gallons. You could probably go down to three and be all right. But yeah. um, you just have so many inconsistencies with the smaller batches um, that it makes it really hard to replicate if you do happen to stumble across something. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And the way that I've kind of put it is shooting at a target um, at 10 feet versus 25 feet versus 50 feet. You know, yeah. that, that accuracy is just a little bit more difficult to get. Yep. Consistency, all that. I'm going to open up this beer from Daniel Weber, which was sent to us a couple weeks ago. Um, we've got more beers in, the t in, in there that I will promise I will get to at some point. Um, but uh, I feel felt like with this being a uh, strange ingredients uh, episode, we would go with this one because it is a Hazy Rye Munich Quike mm. Smoked Pale Ale. Hmm. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so this can go one of two ways. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I love it when the uh, and, and I totally get it. I do the exact same thing, but the the, the name of the beer is just the description in like long sentence uh -huh. of <laughs> the characteristics or the ingredients. Or <laughs> uh, thoughts on reusing yeast from a seltzer on an IPA from Lars? I don't like it. Yeah, it's a uh, for one the, the yeast is probably going to be a little bit stressed out just because um, because of lack of nutrients in there. Uh, and two, the strains you're using on a seltzer generally aren't going to be the best strains for IPAs. Um, typically, they're going to be, um, you know, we, we prefer to use like a Saison strain. A lot of times there's some kind of Belgian strain in there or even a wine strain a lot of times, which that obviously would not work at all for <laughs> an IPA. Um, so, yeah, I, I would probably oh, avoid that. Um, right. Use something that suits hops a little bit more. Mm -hmm. so. Besides dumping it, what can you do with beer you end up not liking? We already mentioned adding Brett and letting yes. it sit. Yes, mm -hmm. when in doubt, Brett it up. My two kind of go-to things are adding Brett and letting it sit or uh, blending with something else. Yeah. 
Someone's asking if we can do a uh, Lalamand. Uh, the blending is a good thing. We should talk more about that. But should we do? Can we do a Lalamand video? Because we did the Fermentus video. Mm. Well, we probably should at some point in time. The Lalamand has a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Oh man, my comments skipped all over the place. Um. So everything that is in that description is in that beer. I get the earthiness from the rye. It's mm -hmm. obviously a hazy. Um, the Munich, I probably don't like as much as I, as I would want to. I think that kind of adds an extra depth that I don't really need. The smoke is definitely there, and I don't love it, <laughs> but I, I don't hate it. <laughs> yeah, the, I, the thing that stood out to me is that that smoke uh, element is in it, but it's not coming off like plastic phenols. Yeah, exactly. That's, that was my biggest fear, especially in an IPA. I was thinking that too. I was like, oh, we'll see. But be, yeah, yeah uh, no, it's, it's nice. It's subtle enough that it's actually it's, it's, it's fine. Like These flavors don't work together, but this beer is actually not bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the quike too, it's a good quike fermented. And so you get a little bit of extra fruitiness that I think helps complement the hops. I'm surprised with a beer that this it has this much going on that those hops still come out nice and aromatic. Yeah. And to me, the mouth feels a little bit lighter than I was expecting between color and everything going on with it. Yeah. And, yeah. Normally when I see a beer this color, by the way, I'm very skeptical. <laughs> and when I put this to my face, I was really surprised and in, in, in a pleasant way it's yeah is that it's, the uh it's what, a what good is that? Is that i'm gonna call it a good brood a well brewed beer a good beer in that sense that said all these flavors are like would i put them together probably not <laughs> definitely got some clarity issues um, oh it's supposed it, to be hazy. hazy yeah it's a hazy ipa with a uh, well, hazy pale ale with rye munich quike and smokedness Wow, that is a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, ABV 7.1, so it is a little bit bigger. 30-ish um, IBUs, uh, starting gravity of 1066, final gravity of 1012, so it is a little bit drier than... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I got a question about weed and general um, hops that <clears throat> would go with it and what you're trying to get out of them if you're trying to cover them up or cover oh. up the, the marijuana flavor mm -hmm. or if you... And I, I, I guess I'm kind of putting... An answer to this already, but if you want to complement the the hop or the marijuana flavor, yeah. Uh, for me, some uh, the, the companion hops to that, I really like uh, Mosaic for its kind of grassiness. Complements there, um, Amarillo for that. Um, it's Amarillo, I think, that's got the high mercine content yeah. that yeah. goes very well Super, with that. Super, like orangey and a little bit dank. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the other one, kind of the third one for me, is Columbus. I really Columbus, like dry yeah. hopping with Columbus. Um, it's got that punchy, dank quality to it. Did you say mosaic too? Yeah, uh, yeah mosaic, Amarillo, yeah. and Columbus. Okay. Those are my favorite like, I think complimentary that, <laughs> yeah. hops. I think mosaic is like you can't go wrong with it. Yeah. You're just doing, um, I mean, I would, as I would, I would say, all those are, are definitely like the same theory that I would go with. But I'm gonna add one mm -hmm. thing because those are definitely the like let's add enough punch to everything with super high oil content hops to make sure that you've got that you know, almost cover up. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if you can do weed in the right way that, you know, weed isn't bad tasting weed. Right. Here, no, I love the, the flavors yeah, right? actually. <laughs> then I would say uh, going with a nice white whiny uh, kind of uh, hop, maybe Nelson mm -hmm. Sauvin or yeah, something yeah. like that. I haven't um, done that, but that sounds really awesome. Yeah. Uh, just a different kind of way to go with it. But yeah. that's if you're not trying to cover up the weed, you're trying to let the weed shine. Um, also, mm -hmm. uh, kind of already gave this earlier, but hemp seed, I think is a good way to kind mm -hmm. of get that flavor without getting the extra Everyone needs to expense. hit the like. If we get 169 likes, uh, Peter will cut my hair live next week. That's um, true. Into a bowl cut. Into a bowl cut. Oh, no, not a bowl cut. I look terrible <laughs> in a bowl cut. Oh, yeah. I grew up in the 90s. Well, yeah. <laughs> you said bowl cut. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the 90s. I actually had a bowl cut at one point in time. I'm, like, I'm so <laughs> grateful to my parents. I never had to deal with that. Yeah, no, it was one of those things you just look back and you're like, oh, yeah. who thought that was a good idea? Uh, <laughs> Jimmy J used oaked cubes in the barley wine he dropped off. We'll we'll get to that next week. Uh, Ryan's uh, here. Uh, that door's probably not locked. Ryan, the other door's unlocked. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, there was another good one I missed. Dang it. Out of taste. Uh, have we made a video on finding agents? Uh, yes, yes, we did. Uh, a while ago, actually, we yeah. we covered all kinds of different finding agents. Um, which, that was when we first moved in, like before the shop was even built. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot out there. Uh, we prefer to use a product um, for the small batches called Super Clear. Clear spelled with a K instead of a C. 
Um, it's a two-stage finding agent with Kiesel Sol, which is the same thing as Biofine. Um, it's a vegan, positively charged uh, thing. And then Kytosan, which is uh, negatively – actually, I switched those. But you get what I'm saying. So bull, uh, multiple polarities that's working to pull out uh, your proteins and your yeast cells. So that's our favorite. Otherwise, there is a ton <coughs> out there all work um, to more or less um, the same extent. So – Revan said that I'm I'm seventy percent to a bowl cut. <laughs> You're already mostly there. <laughs> Korean baby poop one. Uh, I have a good friend that calls it penis head. Oh, <laughs> we're we're having trouble with my four year old wanting to cut his hair. Yeah. So I'm about to make a deal with him. And I mean my hair's been growing for a while. <laughs> and I'm like, All right, man, his name's Dugan. I'm like, Dugan, all right, maybe we cut our hair together. You wanna do this? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, uh, <laughs> H-U-W Colbeck says, I've joined at a strange time, or has the whole stream been this way? Uh, <laughs> and he joined right after we started talking about Tongsol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Idaho Farmhouse Ales, is there a spreadsheet available for unusual ingredients and amounts and processes? I don't think there is. I don't think it's Somebody consistent. should do that. I feel like that's a milk the funk thing. I, yeah, I feel like that's a people who want to spend a lot of time doing smart things that we don't want to spend a lot of time doing. Uh, Aren't all dispensaries decarboxylating before uh, with weed before sales? No, I don't think so because usually that just happens naturally when you smoke it, right? Yeah, uh, I am. Mean, yeah, there's there's some products like you know edibles, tinctures, things like that that are all going to be that way. But if you're just getting raw flour, it's just been dried. Yeah. Um, we got uh, Esteban. Uh, is asking about uh, bottle. He's worried about bottle bombs with something. Sorry, I'm trying to like go back on this whole conversation. Someone uh, wants to make a porcini stein beer. That sounds pretty good. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Some oh, cheese uses intestine intestine fluids, don't they? Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, cow intestines is where you originally got rennet from, mm -hmm. and rennet is what's used to coagulate the milk proteins into the curds. Um, Esteban, can you uh, repeat that question about the bottle carbonation? We're, uh, I'm, I'm a little. I think it might have to do with finings. He might be worried that if he finds in his fermenter before transferring to a bottle, um, that it won't carbonate. Um, oh, there won't be enough at, yeast at in least, suspension. Yeah, at least that would that would be a, a genuine concern. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, that that <coughs> is possible, but more than likely, you're still going to have some yeast in there um, to to carbonate it for you. Um, what I would just say is if you add your findings, um, when you add that second part to it, or, or if you're adding your findings, um, give them maybe just a day or two um, before actually racking into a bottle so you still have some of those findings working in suspension for mm -hmm. you. Um, and that way it should drop out you know, a lot of the yeast, but you'll still have um, plenty in there to get the beer carbonated. So. Um, I mean, I know some other folks doing it this way. I've, I haven't um, used a ton of uh, finding agents and so on, but... Um, just cause it's not something that's super important to me personally, but I totally get it. Uh, another thing is I, I know people will fully, even fully filter low micron, get the yeast entirely out of there yeah. and then pitch, uh, a, a, a conditioning yeast. Yeah. Yeah. And that's along you know, with I, your priming sugar. I, I don't know why I didn't even think about that. Yeah. You could just take a really tiny pinch. If you've got a yeast slurry that's active in something mm -hmm. else. Well, they even um, sell like the pitchable, the, the bottle conditioning yeast. Yeah. So yeah. For it. Yeah, really I, I feel like that's probably way more dextrose. than you'd really need for a five-gallon batch. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, ta I'm talking about, like, <clears throat> basically getting a yeast smear. <laughs> that's, God, I'm really good with words today. Yeah, <laughs> I immediately thought of Candida albicans. Uh. Uh. Um, to what degree will amylase enzyme in the mash affect the haze and mouthfeel of a NEPA because it's of its effect in removing starch haze? Uh, so, honestly, you generally need a super low mash temperature for that am for the right kind of amylase, which can be beta amylase, to do, to do that specifically. Um, also, very much depends on the starch content. And so you can use – I always like to almost always mash low and do a ramping effect. Um, unless you're talking about adding actual amylase en enzyme, in which case things like uh, OptiMash and Amylex 4T are actually an enzyme blend, uh, and those do have protein and longer chain, uh, basically, uh, branch attackers. So things will atta attack branches in the starches, and that will remove a good amount of, of haze. But if you're just doing a regular mash and you have you know 40% adjunct malt, you will have no problem having a hazy beer in the end, regardless of how you do your mash. 
Perfect. Um, and then maybe just a couple last questions here before we wrap this guy up. Uh, we got a really good one um, about finding agents and if they affect head retention and a good finding agent should not affect head retention at all. So, right. A lot uh, of people were using, uh, what was that called? I just completely spaced it. The one that's going out of the one that's no longer made. Ah. Mm -hmm. Sparkloid. A lot oh, of people yeah, use yeah, Sparkloid yeah. for that exact same thing. Yeah. And, and Sparkloid was, was really good at not uh, removing any flavors or anything like that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, it was a diatomaceous earth, essentially, um, uh, finding agent. So, yeah, fully vegan and all that, but there's been some problematic yeah. things with diatomaceous earth, even the culinary versions. So they just ah. decided to discontinue it. Okay, here's uh, Esteban's original question. Um, he's He was concerned about, uh, he's got a, uh, done a five month secondary and he's worried there won't be enough yeast uh, for bottle conditioning mm. at that point. And yeah, I, I would say at five months, go ahead and try to throw a little bit of fresh yeast in mm -hmm. there. Um, just because, if, if anything else, because cause the yeast that's been sitting in there after five months, probably some stupidly low viability at that point. Um, so, and I'm guessing it's probably a higher alcohol beer too. Yeah. If you, if you're done. <laughs> I just realized Daniel's on the live stream. Thanks for the beer, Daniel. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. I'm excited <laughs> to try the other one too. The other one sounded a little bit more focused. And this, like I said, this is a well-brewed beer. It's just, yeah, I mean, I'm enjoying it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Well, there you go, Daniel. I'm glad we got some uh, feedback for you. I know we have a lot of other beers in there. I am, um, uh, yeah, and I'm also, I'm honestly really glad that you're on the live stream when we got to taste it on yeah, the live cool. stream. So, uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Everyone else should tune in all the time, every single week. Don't miss an episode. Also, if you haven't yet, give this video a thumbs up. <clears throat> if this video gets a lot of thumbs up before we end the video, then what happens is the video gets a lot more views after, which means we get more money. Um, brew I'm in favor of that for these guys. <laughs> I'm in favor for myself too. Uh, yeah. I'm also All right. about to get stabbed with a knife. I guess like Whoa, there's a whole conversation you. going about uh, about uh, this uh, yeast and adding at bottling now. Uh, and the strain that I would go for, especially for high alcohol strains that I've had great success with several times, uh, is a strain from ooh, it's called CBC Dash One. Is it from? Wow, that's from Lollamond. Is it from Lollamond? Yeah. So it's it's a Lollamond strain. It's literally um, designed to be a, a basically a um, cask ale conditioning. Mm -hmm. strain. Super good at um, fermenting simple sugars. So. Super good at not doing anything outside of fermenting simple sugars, and super alcohol tolerant. So there you go. That would be my go-to. Otherwise, if you've got a nice, you know, healthy, clean ale strain kicking around, um, that should also do the job for you. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. If you haven't already, still give this video a thumbs up. Mm. We're, uh, let's get to 100, guys. 16 more. Let's do it. Um, you have approximately one minute before Ryan clicks end stream <laughs> and uh, stops this whole process. Uh, and so. uh, we have a dance that's done on, on there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan just commented, like the video, and Logan will get naked. That's 100% true. If we get 169 <laughs> I mean, likes. I'll get naked regardless. So. <laughs> That's just going to happen right. at some All right, point boys, in time. You better, uh, you better watch out. Oh, on boy. This. Don't do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Ready? Uh, Logan, this is the episode know. where Logan destroys all world. our camera equipment. <laughs> oh. Thousands of dollars of camera equipment just get <laughs> just blown up. So, it oh. did a little bit. <laughs> I'm happy. You know, I'll rope climb and go up to the... No. <laughs> That rope is not easy to climb, by the way. It's very uh, thin. Oh, it's, yeah. Don't do it, Logan. I'm going to invert. Logan. I'm going to invert. 12 more lights. I'm gonna 12 invert. more likes. I'm going to do it. We're 12 there. more likes. I show 11. Thomas, you might want to move. I'm going to get out of this going to be way. in your face. <laughs> Logan's going to hit his head. If Logan dies in this, this is not my fault. By the way, we have no <laughs> L and I claims. I'm going to swing him now. <laughs> All right, 12 more likes, guys. You guys can do this. All right, ready? I got to wrap my foot around. <laughs> oh, you're going to hit, you're going to tip uh, over the beer. Always like, if you want to support us, go to GeniusBrewing.com. Buy we, it, some swag. We've got shirts. <laughs> we've got shirts and stuff. Uh, we do this every Sunday at 8.45. Not this. We don't do this every Sunday. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. Specific Standard Time. Thank you, time. everyone, Pacific. for tuning in. Specific. All right, my <laughs> foot hurts. I have to look at you. <laughs> And we'll see we'll see you next week. <laughs>